Jenna, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good morning. Nice to see you. Yeah, likewise. I was reflecting over the weekend about um, our chat today because it must be about four years almost since our first chat when you came on my old podcast. Um, we didn't know each other. I, I think I reached out to you on Instagram. Um, yeah. And it's it's always interesting to reflect on those things and sort of appreciate how much things have changed since then. Yeah, got it. Would yeah, definitely. I remember sitting in my old house before we moved here, um, and yeah, that conversation. I'm so pleased we connected. <laughs> Just think, you know, four years ago, complete strangers having a chat around leaky gut. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and then kind of connecting on a weekly basis, having chats and exploring stuff. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And, and doesn't the world seem like it was much simpler then somehow, oh. <laughs> especially in, in our area of work? <laughs> in so many ways, it was a lot simpler, um, <laughs> it's professionally, but also personally. Yeah. <laughs> as well. four, four years ago, at the beginning of a, of a relationship and now married with a with little Oscar, six months old. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> So our chat today is is obviously to some degree kind of on immunity because that's yeah. your area of expertise but it's I guess a little bit freestyle we don't exactly know where it's going to go but um, we just spoke off air about although a lot of people are talking about the role of immunity and what sort of influences immunity um, I think I certainly regularly need to be reminded about how important some of the basics are within this, as well as how some of the terminology and concepts that we often read, listen, or hear about on social media or Dr. Google um, mm -hmm. are in some ways incorrect, I guess, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps today we sort of explore kind of some of the key lifestyle elements and dietary elements that really help modify the immune system and help people just understand things because I think that's pretty important when we're talking about um, the immune system and, and health generally if we can have a fundamental understanding of how these things actually work mm -hmm. um, it I think it can also help from a behavioral perspective knowing the why yeah exactly so where to start what <laughs> comes to mind <laughs> I think um yeah I, I would I, I've sort of been speaking about the immune system for quite a few years I sort of fell in love with it about 20 years ago and I kind of stumbled into the field um, and that's what drew me to start sort of talking about it online and uh, as a little kind of personal uh, way to document my thoughts and how passionate I am about understanding the immune system and then in the last sort of six months we're sort of 18 months into this Covid thing I think I kind of um, I reached this weird point where I was like, I don't know what to say anymore about the immune system because it's so much noise. Everybody's talking about the immune system. Everybody's coming across with their take on it. And some of it's amazing, some of it's a bit obscure and some of it's just fundamentally not right. And, and it's just, it became really strange for me. I just, I felt like, like, what can I contribute to this noise right now that would be useful for people? But I think like you say, bringing it back to the fundamentals is always it's underrated and we can't sort of um yeah stress the importance of that I noticed being on social media that what people like is to feel like they have a sense of agency over their health in the face of a risk of an infection like covid for example so people are um really like those kind of messages around what supplements to take to either stop you getting sick or what to take once you are sick um and so maybe we could talk about that a little bit because uh you know uh, I mean I've been a bit of a self-experimenter for years I love a good uh, uh exploring some supplements and and reading the research around them but I know all too well that that it's kind of like a drop in the ocean if you haven't been sort of covering the bases properly in other areas of your life and um for me probably not long after our conversation four years ago I was um a bit stressed 
taking on too much because I didn't really understand what the concept of boundaries were in personal or professional life um, and I got a cold and my family members got the cold and it was just one of those seasonal infections uh, and everyone else got better and I didn't get better because I just didn't stop I just kept going to work doing the nursery run being mum da, da, da. and then um, three weeks into having this cold I woke, woke up and I couldn't get out of bed and I couldn't take care of my kids and I just completely like was broken and um, I crawled uh, to my uh, doctor and um, they told me I had pneumonia. Oh wow. <laughs> so a routine cold that I ignored <laughs> turned into pneumonia. <laughs> And I find this really interesting because people are either really scared of COVID or they're really like, oh, you know, it, it's such a mild infection. M nearly everyone recovers. It's not a big deal. And I'm like, well, you know, rhinovirus that causes the common cold is a really mild infection. <laughs> but depending on the context of the body that it's infecting, you know, and I was eating well because I, I do. It's something I'm passionate about. Um, but I was just, I was very stressed and the stress affected how well I was sleeping. Um, and then that kind of had that trickle down effect on all those other aspects of my lifestyle. Um, and just the fact that we have, maybe it's changing now, but we had had a culture of presenteeism in the UK, whereby when people had a mild infection, they would go to work anyway. I mean, how many times has, has that happened where we've struggled on the bus, did their commute, went into the office, was apologizing because we're coughing and sneezing. Um, and this is something that I feel quite passionate about that I want to change. And I kind of was hopeful that we might change it with, with COVID, whereby when you're sick, you're sick, you let your body recover. You know, even having a tiny fever, it dramatically increases um, your metabolism so you have between a 10 and 15 percent increase in demands for energy being directed to your immune cells um, so you shouldn't be off doing your normal activities if you can help it because that's sort of triaging energy away from your immune system and not giving it that opportunity to fight off the infection so I thought with COVID suddenly we're all really um, uh, aware of you know the fact that coughs and sneezes spread diseases that when people have symptoms they should stay home um but then i've realized we've all switched to online working and then i go to work meetings where <laughs> colleagues are there in a zoom meeting and they're like oh coughing sorry i've got covid but i just wanted to come to this meeting and i'm like well you should just go and rest like can we just create this culture now where we take illness seriously and it's better to have one day on the sofa and be back on your feet quicker than to just say oh it's only a mild infection I'll just continue I'll go to the gym I'll you know do my usual activities and or take lots of over-the-counter medicines just to suppress the symptoms but you're actually also suppressing your immune system's ability to sort of fight it off yeah. so I'm not sure where where we'll end up once COVID sort of settles down but I think that you know we we can take the top five supplements to make us well again when we're got symptoms of a, a minor infection but it's what you do every day those little things that you do every day that are worth so much more in terms of your resilience to infection and your ability to bounce back um, and since my experience with pneumonia I am so much more boundary about things like my sleep and how I manage my stress and recognizing when I'm taking on too much and that it's okay to push back and prioritize my health and you know take time to recover when I am sick even though uh, you know having kids it's not always so easy but you know you just have to ask for help and draw on what support you can get in the network you have around you yeah I mean, that's such a, an important point and it goes so deep because I've been reflecting a little bit on, on both boundaries, which I've mentioned quite a lot since becoming a dad, because like you, I didn't really have any. Uh, and like, like many in our industry, you know, we're both passionate yeah. about learning, but we're also passionate about helping people. Yeah. And I think often that comes at the expense of sometimes our own health as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I think since fatherhood, you know, it's just it's kind of forced me to to learn to say no and to have healthy yeah. boundaries. And I think sometimes that can be quite triggering, both for us or people right. that we're starting to say no to who we've all, always said yes to. Yeah. Um, and I was reflecting the other day on sort of how we compliment people and what we compliment people on. So going back yeah. to what you were saying of it's a mild infection, I'm just going to kind of hustle through and continue working. Yeah. And we sometimes, especially if we're not, if we don't have like your knowledge, for example, we, we almost applaud that. Uh, yes. And we go, oh, my God, that guy or that girl is just so committed. Uh, yes. They work so hard. They're up at six. They have their routine. But yeah. underneath that, I think, is often, you know, there is there's something a lot deeper that is driving that sort of behavior um, that yeah. can be explored. But we're all so busy. We don't have the time necessary to understand why aren't we allowing ourselves to sit on the couch for a day when we're feeling unwell. Yeah. But that's probably a whole different podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, exactly. <laughs> but I like coming back to the idea of, of prevention as well and okay. what are the fundamental components that we should be prioritizing that help I always try and consciously use the words modulate our immune system so it yeah. has that resiliency it has the resources it requires um, mm. so perhaps kind of that's where we can sort of direct this conversation yeah I think of it as like preventative maintenance mm -hmm. you know it's just kind of I, I don't know why it was such a big learning for me because now I look back and think it makes perfect sense but because I'm asked a lot by different people and either friends and family or on social media about what what are the key things they can do and the, the, what I kind of aggregate all this information in my mind think I'm being asked in essence the same questions um, and the best answer I, I feel I can give, it's like, what are the little things across all areas of your lifestyle that you can do every day on your worst days, as well as your best days? And it's that consistency, like the word consistency just keeps coming back to mind again and again and again, because the more consistent you are, the more things become routine, they become automatic, that self-care is automatic that the more resilience that you have at the end of the day. And I think everyone will have a different starting point depending on your kind of, I think of it as your immune biography. So what, what happened to get you to this point where you're standing now? Um, so everybody has a slightly different story. They have different traumas, different medications they've taken, different exposures in different environments. Um, but we can sort of generally think about the food and diet side of things, then the sort of trauma, mental health side of things, then the environment and the sort of physical activity. Um, and I guess the microbiome kind of influences all of those different areas. Mm. And what can we do across those different areas consistently that will sort of keep us in the best possible state of health? And, and that will be, you know, again, different for everyone, depending on where you're at, um, be different for someone who's younger than me, someone who's much older than me, whatever phase you're in in your life. Um, and I think when I wrote my first book, I put the food section last because I kind of wanted to elevate the other areas of lifestyle above mm -hmm. diet, because we always think about diet and immune system. And in fact, one of the reasons I started writing online about the immune system was because I was so bored of like reading about vitamin C and zinc <laughs> as being like what your immune system needs. And I thought that's so outdated and just really reductionist and, you know, just let's go beyond those two nutrients or maybe vitamin d's in there as well like yes they're important but there's so much more that i just find fascinating and i think um the, the whole symphony of plant nutrients working together um is something that i think is you know we're on this sort of journey of discovery in the literature because this tens of thousands of these phytonutrients. Um, there's some that have been really well studied, like there's lots of literature on curcumin and turmeric, but then there's some that are way more obscure um, and we're only starting to uncover. And I'm just, my, my mind gets blown when I read something new about 
something that's found in a herb that we might use every day or um, in like leafy green vegetables. I just think that we need to be bringing that into our, our diet as much as possible and letting that symphony kind of do its work together um, and not trying to find that in a supplement. I've really kind of gone from someone who was always a bit of a self-experimenter with supplements to someone who's like, I don't want to have to take anything. I want to get what I need from how I live my life. Um, and I think that's the attitude that we should try and adopt. So instead of being like, oh, I'm going to be bulletproof and resilient with my 10 bottles of supplements I take in the morning, but I'm doing all the things I can throughout my daily life that means I don't need to waste my money on so many things yeah. um, and this is talking for the general person who's who's not struggling with a particular health issue because as you know as a practitioner it's there's so much utility in what you can do with giving people that extra support through using supplements so it's not to be like anti-supplements <laughs> at all but I just think if we all have this mindset of trying to have the least intervention as possible then perhaps we can elevate the other aspects of, of lifestyle and diet yeah i think again it's such a huge point and it, it certainly i can look at my own journey as well i've been a, a supplement popper and at times i've i've been aware of of the mindset but not necessarily been able to sort of truly shift it it's kind of like you know this idea that i'm really lacking something that I need a, a pill to fix mm -hmm. um, and it's it's been certainly the last six months has been a huge transition for me from that perspective and I think that partly comes from reading more around you know even the role that sunshine plays in all sorts of different areas of our physiology it's not just a vitamin d um, thing that we need to be yeah. thinking about but it's it's really I think grounded me in the idea that as you say, and as we'll discuss more, those daily habits, those routines that actually, if we can do consistently, are by far the most powerful thing that we can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate sometimes life can be manic and we might need some additional support, but yeah. we've, I think simultaneously got to be working on, well, how can we slow down? What can we start saying no to? So we can cultivate that little bit of time and space in our day to deflate, as I sometimes think about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I think in, in terms of food, it's 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 its own language that's translated into our body, but we need to really consider first our relationship to food. I think that's as a as a mother, I'm just like, what is this world we now live in? Like this concept of the food environment, which I have become aware of more and more. Um, and that just sort of refers to like the marketing we're exposed to, the number of sort of food outlets and um, what, what sort of food places we walk past in our streets, what, what we're exposed to in our daily life, what marketing we get from different sources of media. Um, that is having a profound effect on our relationship with food and I think we've all almost pathologized feeling hungry or feeling full so it, everyone's just confused we have all these public health guidelines on what to eat but actually the biggest struggles reported by people trying to make dietary improvements is not a lack of knowing what to eat it's actually emotional eating stress eating um, cravings, struggling with um, planning, uh, eating too quickly, um, portion size, like that's what what we need to be addressing first before we even talk about what people are putting on their plates or how's, you know, how can we get people out of a bad relationship with food and create a better one? And it's, you're going against the tide because all this sort of marketing and things that we're exposed to in the food environment is sort of just wanting to sell us stuff and make us eat more often. And we know that over consuming calories is a big problem uh, and it's contributing to a lot of poor um, health outcomes, but also over consuming calories is just a real issue for the immune system. It's, um, it, it's quite taxing on the body, the, the process of digestion that creates a certain level of oxidative stress um and you know it 
eating is inflammatory. Uh, there's a rise in inflammatory markers in the hours after we've eaten a meal, even a very healthy meal. This is very transient and normal. But, you know, studies show that we're now eating for up to 18 hours a day. Um, and we're, <laughs> there was a smartphone study, I can't remember who, who did it now, but they got people to document when they're eating and what they were eating. And it was, you know, people are spending 18 hours a day in a fed state. That's like a postprandial state where you have this um, dietary inflammation occurring after eating. So that's a huge tax on your body when you, your body's having to deal with that inflammation it's taking resource away from your ability to fight infections. So I think, you know, anyone who wants to eat for their immune system eats because they want to stay well, um, should really start to look at their relationship with food and trying to uh, create meals that are satiating and, and don't feel like you're denying yourself anything, but at the same time, you're, you're starting the digestive process in your mouth and how many of us eat really quickly yeah. <laughs> myself included my daughter eats really slowly and she always says to me at dinner table slow down, <laughs> slow down. <laughs> when your six-year-old is telling you that you know that it's something that you've got <laughs> you've got to work on but I think for me it's a habit I've just developed you know probably since I was a child and uh, you know I can't tell you the number of people that have digestive issues. I don't know what the current stats are and things like irritable bowel, but just starting the digestive process properly in our mouth and taking time to eat, um, eating really mindfully. And these are things that I can admit I find really hard from years of being someone who eat at my desk, you know, in between doing a million things. Yeah, I find it incredibly hard to eat mindfully, um, eat slowly, take my time you know but I can feel the benefits when I do that my digestive system's happy I feel a lot lighter I feel a lot better I feel much more satiated and I'm ready to then go for as many hours as I need before my next meal and I think that's something that is a real fundamental and people don't necessarily make that link to how that's supporting your immune system but that's kind of the first uh, step and being able to really reconnect with your hunger and your fullness. Um, because again, that's something I think many of us have lost that sort of interception, that feeling of, of are we full, are we hungry? And what's driving that hunger? Is it an emotional hunger? Is it because we haven't eaten for so many hours and we genuinely have a hunger? Um, and it's okay to eat if it's an emotional hunger, but it's kind of checking in with that. And then it can help you maybe make a better choice about what you eat or how much you eat rather than kind of just opening the floodgates to that emotional eating that might then drive a cycle of, of guilt. And, you know, leptin and ghrelin are these hormones that are kind of playing this balancing act with um, your hunger and your fullness. And these have pro and anti-inflammatory roles. And ghrelin is kind of more considered the anti-inflammatory and leptin can be more pro-inflammatory. If we lose touch or we lose sensitivity to these, then it, it kind of destroys that ability to really connect with your hunger and fullness as well. So I think nurturing a good relationship with food, knowing triggers, external cues that, that might lead you to eat, whether that's a stress at work or something in your relationship. And so asking yourself, am I in full control of this eating decision? Um, am I being influenced by something outside of uh, my control? And then that pause can really help you take a better path with what you do next, you know, and checking in with yourself. If you're not actually that hungry, you don't, you know, eat to, to when you feel comfortable but you don't have to have a giant meal just because everyone around you is mm -hmm. um and balancing those meals to balance all the other aspects like blood sugar which i think is another huge aspect of affecting our immune system too much sugar hanging out about in our blood for too long or that huge spike which is followed by the huge crash which normally makes us feel hungrier quicker um, and it's been shown that we're more likely to overconsume calories when we hit that blood sugar roller coaster. 
Um, again, too much sugar in the blood for too long is impairing a lot of our sort of first line immune functions. And there was a really interesting study that used a kind of computer um, artificial intelligence thing to, to look at um, risk factors for severe COVID and having poor blood sugar control was listed as one of the key um, links to having a, a poorer outcome from COVID infection. I can't remember exactly what they did in the study, but I can send it to you if you want to add it in the yeah, it'd be amazing. Um, the links. Um, but it, it makes sense because, you know, blood sugar can affect the function of our immune cells. We're not supposed to have sugar hanging around in our blood too long because it can, it's sticky, it changes um, how proteins are working and uh, insulin as well has an effect on the function of our immune cells. So we need that to be working you know, harmoniously together so that when we eat, you, blood sugar rises, but in a controlled way and our body deals with it and then everything goes back to that homeostasis. Mm, so interesting. And am I right in saying that during infection, there is a degree of insulin resistance that can occur as a result as well? You know, again, this idea of the body's just a distribution center. It's kind of diverting its resources to what needs it most. Exactly. Uh, it's part of um, the effects of having inflammation. So when we're actively fighting an infection and we have inflammation rising as part of that response to, to proactively remove the infection, then we need to kind of make more resources available. So then there's mechanisms at play that will cause a degree of short term insulin resistance to allow us to have uh, more available um glucose and the same with stress as well part of the actions of the stress response is to shove loads of glucose into your bloodstream to to fuel that journey to safety or whatever it is that short-term mechanism to sort of get away um from you know whatever the threat is and then if you think about how we live today's world i mean we're inflamed and we're stressed <laughs> so those are kind of causing chaos with our blood sugar um before you even get to what foods you're putting on your plate and, and then into your body mm, yeah I think it was um it was the beginning of last year actually just before the first lockdown where I, I wore a continual glucose monitor oh, just out of pure curiosity you know it was it was doing the rounds on social media and it was certainly big in the biohacking space and I thought okay, okay well, let's give this a try and it was really interesting to see you know sort of my personal responses to certain foods and how at least on a few occasions, how having the same thing at different times of day seems to influence what was going on with blood sugar levels. Yes. Um, but it was, you know, you can do it for a couple of weeks. It doesn't cost much. Um, yeah. I do think it can be a really powerful way to understand, you know, what's going on in our bodies ultimately, because we might not realize it obviously on the topic of kind of blood glucose, certainly. Yeah, I would um, love that um I, I'm kind of one of those people who's always fascinated about getting data and readouts from my body that I can just sort of have a look at um, from a personal interest point of view but I have never done it was there any foods that really um surprised you that you sort of um, eat regularly to be honest, there wasn't like I I'm pretty I guess the way that I naturally eat is one which you know should be pretty conducive to stable blood sugar levels mm -hmm. um it was at a time when I was having to spend a reasonable amount of time in hospital um, because of a family member. And, you know, just being that, there were a couple of times when I'd have to pick something up from the MS in the hospital yeah. uh, and trying to pick the best of a bad bunch. It was kind of a wholemeal sandwich, like a chicken salad sandwich on wholemeal. But yeah. that still skyrocketed my blood sugar. Um, and, you know, there's pretty adequate levels of protein. Um, yeah. a huge amount of chicken but it was still 25 30 grams I think of protein from memory um, but yeah it really had a huge negative impact on blood sugar um, I also was surprised that at the time I was going to uh, the local gym so I'd have a, a kind of a strong coffee in the morning I'd then work out and then go to the sauna and I was really mindful that I thought you know that kind of early morning sort of coffee exercise I was wondering whether that would kind of influence blood sugar over the rest of the day I sometimes felt yeah. like it did but my blood sugar levels were completely stable post coffee through training 
and then they would go up uh, with the sauna as you would kind of expect yeah. Um, yeah. so I was kind of really happy to know that actually the coffee didn't seem to be having any impact and oh, that's... maybe because of the exercise it was kind of blunting a response or something okay. yeah I, I always use coffee as like my pre-workout so I would be curious to see if that uh, yeah. yeah and the meal timings thing I think is quite interesting particularly when they've done studies on shift workers and eating throughout the night, it seems to be that people are a bit more intolerant to carbohydrates and sort of deal with them uh, not as well mm. when you're in the middle of the night. So, yeah, I think that I love those studies that, um, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name now. Oh, Tim Spector did with the PREDICT trials where they looked at twins and the blood sugar response to various foods. And they found that even, even in identical twins, you could have a huge difference in the blood sugar response to a meal, um, to the same meal. And I just thought, you know, there's, again, it comes back to that simple messaging that people put on social media about don't eat these foods for your blood sugar. But actually, you know, some people can have a bowl of white rice and their blood sugar is hardly moving. And some people have a bowl of white rice and they're on that roller coaster. Yeah. And so unless you've got a continuous glucose monitor and, or you have the, a, that insight into your body, you know, you, don't, you shouldn't be following these <laughs> overly simplified messages on them um, on social media. Um, but one thing that, that those studies revealed was that a big part of that is down to the microbes that you have in, in your gut. So that seemed to be the biggest difference between identical individuals who had these different responses to the same meal. Yeah. I often think like my, um, my granddad, I grew up on a farm and my grandparents had the farm before we then took it over. Um, and, you know, he would just have this giant bowl of porridge every morning. And I never saw him hangry. I never saw him, like, have that blood glucose drop. <laughs> but then I also think, you know, he was from a different time. Um, and maybe his gut microbes were less er eroded by modern living. Yeah. And he was also very active. So he wouldn't have breakfast until after doing the morning milking the cows. So he's sort of doing that fasted, I guess, and then waking up at five, but eating breakfast at eight, but then going straight back out to work again. And so I kind of like, I'm so curious about, you know, what he did in his day to day life that meant he was in amazing health until he was 95. Wow. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's quite, a, it's a, important uh point about how he passed away because he was um still living independently but he fell off he was cleaning his own chimney because he still had a coal oh, fire this. <laughs> he fell off the roof wow. of his house wow. um onto another flat roof didn't break any bones but ended up in hospital because he was quite severely kind of injured mm. um and and this so maybe brings me to my next point about our immune system in that he was um, stuck in a hospital bed for a really long time and they wouldn't let him go back because they said that he was not safe to live by himself because of this incident that had happened but by virtue of sitting for a man who was very active his whole life he he immediately lost so much muscle mass because he wasn't using his muscles in the same way and the hospital staff very busy you know people didn't even have time to take him to the bathroom and that kind of thing and then he never uh, he lost the ability to walk and this all happened within months of of just being stuck on a hospital bed and then sadly he got covid because it was going around the where he was put and but the importance of muscle mass is again something that people don't consider when they think about their immune system and I'm really passionate about this because in my age bracket I guess I'm, I'm in my 40s and I see lots of um, women that I interact with friends you know mums at school everything people are um, very much they've grown up in that era of you you exercise to burn off calories to have a certain physique and that is like the, the, the thinking that they can't sort of 
break because it's been so in imprinted through you know the time that we grew up um but then i think when you're in your 40s 50s you're you you need to really hold on to that muscle mass and it's very hard to build muscle like i've been trying for years and it's really hard <laughs> but if, women in particular it, that I see in that age bracket they they don't really consider resistance exercise in their kind of weekly they're like I'll go for a run or they're doing like spin bike or they're it's cardio 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 and I think if you're not also taking care of your protein intake um you know you 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 want to be trying to hold on to that muscle mass and not just doing cardio and this these awesome studies um that was done by janet lord who's a professor of immunology at birmingham where they looked at um sedentary 20 somethings and very active 70 somethings um and they found that being sedentary in your 20s you actually had more of what they call thymic involution so the thymus gland in your neck where your t-cells are produced it starts to shrink from your 30s so you you lose the capacity to produce new t-cells from your 30s and it sort of declines as you get older and the t-cells are kind of your master controllers of your immune system because they they can come in many different flavors um different types of t-helper cells t-regulatory cells and so they're they're really foundational to the function of your immune system, both in fighting infection and also in regulating against unwanted immune responses like autoimmune disease. So you want to keep this thymus gland young. And what they found was that in the active 70, 80 year olds, by virtue of them being active and, and keeping their muscle mass, the muscle is producing particular um, cytokines that are rejuvenating to the thymus gland. So it's mitigating this thymic involution, this shrinking of the thymus gland that happens naturally with aging. It's kind of working against it. Um, and I just think that this is so, so important because we know that aging is one of the biggest risk factors for, um, for severe infection and for chronic inflammatory diseases. And in aging isn't chronological in terms of your immune system. You can be 70 and have the immune system of a 50 year old, or you can be 20 and have the immune system of a 50 year old, depending on how you live your life and the muscle mass that your body has. So your overall body composition, how much um, muscle mass and, and fat mass you have. It, this, these are active tissues that are producing molecules that are playing a role in this overall balance of immune aging. And I just think like, wow, if we could get, you know, in terms of the government guidelines in the UK for exercise, everyone knows you should do so many minutes of getting your heart rate up. But how many people also know that you're supposed to do two muscle strengthening exercise sessions per week? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like forgotten about, you know, it drops off people's memory when they're sort of reading, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing, or somehow the cardio feels more important. Um, yeah. I was going to touch on that because it's such, I think that's something I've noticed, which is there's almost a bit of a love and hate relationship with like strength training. People absolutely love it and yeah. benefits or there are a lot of people, and I can think back to when I was primarily a personal trainer who were just really kind of put off by the idea of, of kind of doing weight training, whether that's because they thought they were going to get super muscly or they just didn't think it was as fun. Yeah. Now, I, I'm, I can put my hand up and say I've got a huge bias in the sense that I really enjoy strength training, but I also have had so many people who thought they didn't like it, who did start and actually went on to love it. And I do think that that is probably quite a common occurrence because I think once you're competent and you understand the techniques and you can kind of, you have that autonomy over strength training, I find it incredibly, um, it gets me in my body, I think strength training, and it, it, it helps from a, a boundary perspective. I find that when I'm consistent with my strength training, there's like a ripple effect into other areas of life. Like I generally am more conscious, conscious about what I'm eating and my diet, et cetera. Yeah. And it's just for me, like a complete game changer. Now I know we all have our own sort of preferences, but anyone listening that is hesitant to get into strength training, I would say, you know, give it, give it a month of, you know, three days a week um, and see whether actually if you were to, 
to practice and give it some time that you could actually start to Mm -hmm. enjoy it fundamentally Um, yeah as you say around strength I know there's a fair amount of research looking at things like grip strength and its association with longevity yes exactly that always comes out as a really consistent measure um which again I think is really uh uh interesting and that, yeah you're right it, it it does require more skill than say going for a walk or if you're uh, if you can swim you know going for a swim going for a run or a cycle that that doesn't require particular skills and knowledge but mm-hmm. walking into a gym picking up some weights if you've never done it before requires a lot really because you might not know what you're doing you might feel very self-conscious um i think that at, one of the benefits of the COVID lockdown, I'm trying to put a positive spin on, <laughs> on this, is that, um, you know, it, it sort of forced us all to, to look at fitness in terms of sort of future-proofing uh, our, our physical activity, because suddenly you couldn't rely on going to a gym to get your weekly uh, dose of physical activity. Um, and me, as someone high, I, I like being in the gym, I like being in a class, I, I like sort of giving the energy out and getting it back from the class I, but doing it at home I've always found for years I tried to work out at home and I was just never really because <laughs> I knew I could go to the gym I never really was 100% committed but then when the gym's all shut I was like well I've got to somehow future proof this because who knows how long they'll be shut if they'll shut again what you yeah. know um and so I've just slowly kind of I got up every morning make myself do 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of some kind of movement. Um, and after, I don't know how many months of doing that, it just became, it became a routine. It's like brushing your teeth. Um, I know people say different different lengths of time for how long it takes to, to develop a routine. And I think um, there's probably some science to say what's accurate and what's not, but it's gonna be different for everyone. And I, I just think that those sorts of things are, are so important. Developing that routine where you have a little space in your house and either you just sit down and open your body, do some mobility work, or you get a resistance band, which are really cheap and cheerful, and a YouTube um, with an instructor that you get along with and like their kind of approach and that's ready right for your level mm-hmm. and just do some resistance work, or you do something a bit more vigorous um, and sort of work to where you're at and just do that every day uh, or five days a week or something that's manageable give yourself a manageable goal um, and then the days you don't feel like it you just sit down and do some stretching but it's building the habits building the routine um, I think that's you know really really important when it comes to physical activity and working out what those boundaries are what stops you from working out can you you know do you have to rely on the gym can is there something that you can do because it's about the frequency of moving your body the abundance the diversity so if you're only going to the gym twice a week there's only two opportunities to move your body in different ways but if you're doing 10 15 20 minutes a day every day it's increasing that diversity, it's increasing the frequency, the routine, um, the habitualness of it, which that's the real fundamental. It's how regularly you can do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was the best bit of advice I ever got in regards to like habit formation. And it's something that I, I I guess I sort of semi knew through my own experiences, but hadn't sort of consciously applied, which is over the last decade, I've definitely in all honesty, sort of to and fro with my exercise, as most of us have. Yeah. And for me, trying to get back to the gym after a month, two months, three months of not going, the story in my head was, it's going to be hard because <laughs> I haven't been, and I'm not going to be able to do what I once was able to do, and that's going to be annoying. And that yeah. was actually enough, I think, to kind of make me not go. But as yeah. I reframed it to what you've just said, which is, you know what, I'm going to go, but I'm having no expectations about what I'm doing. I'm not going and saying, right, I'm going to hit a PR or I'm going to do 10 yeah. seconds of whatever. It was, I'm just going to show up and mess around a bit, basically. Um, yeah. And then that consistency, as you say, builds the habit. And then ultimately you get back to a point where you can be your strongest, leanest, whatever it is you're trying to achieve um, yeah. in the too distant future. So I, I can completely... Um, you know agree with what you've said there around just just show up basically yeah it was a good um 
it was a good learning for me because I'd always sort of put the gym as where I did certain things and it was frustrating at home because I didn't have any barbells and I wasn't about to spend lots of money on that and I couldn't do the stuff that I had done before that I loved because I had very limited equipment but I was like you know what I'm still just moving my body and if I you know if we look back and say of 18 months of on and off lockdowns if I just hadn't gone to the gym and hadn't done anything at home my body would be in a very different situation because mm -hmm. a lot of my job is sitting at my computer um then it would be a very different situation than the, just doing those little bits every day and some days I do full-on like hour uh workout some days it's, it's something like just a little bit of yin yoga um but I'm so pleased that I did it and I had I have been back to the gym actually since um and I had real similar thoughts to you uh and I was actually really surprised about how well it went because I was I'd broken my shoulder just before oh, yeah first lockdown and so um I was part of the motivation to work out at home was also to continue the rehab because the physio and everything had stopped and I couldn't move my arm properly so I kind of didn't want to go through life not being able to reach my arm above my head um but then uh, yeah I was it was pleasantly surprising when I got back in the gym and then I had most of the summer off because I was just with the kids and stuff. Um, and then my first time back in the gym after the summer it was awful. It was just, just, a, that, just I didn't. I felt like my body was just all funky, and I was just oh, a bit discombobulated. But then a week later, you know, it was fine. And I think the, the more consistent you are, the easier you bounce back from these little blips in things. And whether that's a blip in how you feel physically or how you feel mentally, or whether you're struggling with an infection or something else that kind of knocks you for six, the consistency allows you to, to buffer that. You know, things like sleep. If you're consistent with your sleep and you're prioritizing a, a consistent bedtime and wake time and getting a good quality of sleep, then you can have a late night with friends and it's not so bad. Mm -hmm. But if your sleep is kind of all over the place, then you have that one late night with friends, your recovery time is much longer. So I know my... My uh, theme seems to be consistency. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, as boring as that might be, there's lots of fancy things you can do, but I just think that's kind of the foundation of everything else. Yeah. And you know, I think it's, it's such an important message because I think it's, it's obviously one of the most consistent messages in the research, consistency. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we also, I'm sure you've seen this, Janet, you know, when sometimes working with clients, there, there's a sort of jumping from one thing to the next. Yeah. Um, and as a result, there isn't enough time to actually almost check whether the thing they tried could actually have provided the benefit that we wanted because there wasn't just that consistency there. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think from a practical perspective, there's lots of reasons to really sort of focus on that. And yeah. I think just before I forget, we've kind of touched on it today, but I guess no matter what we're talking about, whether it's exercise, sleep, stress management stuff, dietary um, sort of uh, habits, I guess, it's all contextual. You know, our exercise volume and intensity needs to mirror deadlines at work and work commitments, family life. And I think I'm certainly guilty of this. And I think a lot of us are, which is our exercise routines have no context to them. Like it's almost like, it's just the same, no matter what's going on in our lives. It's like, this is what I do in the gym. Yeah, and we don't yeah. adapt it to actually how we're feeling mentally, emotionally, physically. Yeah. Um, we just have our routine. Um, exactly. so again, that comes back to really trying to tune into our bodies and listen to what they need at this point in time. Exactly. And one, one thing that I would get frustrated about would, would be my body's ability to do stuff at different times of my menstrual cycle. And then actually, I think, I can't remember who told me this, but a piece of advice I got was when you're feeling the least strength and you're just, you can't deadlift for shit, you're just unable to, to lift that bar, you, you take the weight down and you focus on technique and focus on sort of the fundamentals of the movement. Um, which then are going to help you when you're at that stage in the cycle when you feel like you're can you're you know you're invincible and you can lift anything, and that's you know just making those small shifts instead of being frustrated and 
sort of getting annoyed at yourself because the body's not doing what you want it to do or it should do at that time because that's your gym session it's like actually can I adapt this so it will benefit me at other times but it's interesting what you say about people giving that consistency because I whenever I speak to people or speak to clients that we have at, um, at health paths like often that's a key theme that comes up I tried this and then I was also trying this at the same time and I didn't really know which one was working and then I know I you know if people are taking supplements like do you take them every day or do you take them as you've been prescribed and well I was but then I kind of I haven't been taking this one all the time and and it's it's as they're saying it out loud they're suddenly going oh yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that wasn't what I was meant to do was it I was meant to just do it consistently and give it a certain and so I often kind of think we have to be treating ourselves like an end of one experiment when we're on these kind of journeys because there will be the clinical trials where the most people responded like this but there's a few people that didn't respond like most people and we don't know who those people might be so you have to really take that methodical approach to any changes that you're implementing um have you just read about a new diet and you're doing that like i've spoken to people who are i'm doing the low fodmap but then i also started the aip diet and then i also realized i just wasn't even eating anything oh. <laughs> and then i got really stressed and then i couldn't sleep <laughs> and so it's kind of like you have to be really methodical and and write things down what are you eating how are you feeling um the other theme that i get from from people a lot is like what what foods am I intolerant to and if I remove them all will be good and it's kind of trying to flip that around and be like the food is not the bad guy your body is intolerant to that for a reason let's unpick why that might be and then can we rebuild tolerance to that because that food might be something really like healthy and mm. you know a good staple to have in your diet something for the microbes or you know it's it's flipping that I think you did a really good post on that recently in Instagram yeah um, I was just thinking I mentioned something about it. I'm trying to think what it was oh, I think it was just related to the kind of the the old saying of dis all disease starts in the guts and how yeah. you know, that's just not true um but we still often cite it as something that which is true uh, yeah. and we just respond as you say differently and not only may you and I respond differently to the same foods but I'll respond differently to it tomorrow than I do today, potentially. Yeah, you know, it's exactly. just that sort of contextual. Um, yeah. And I think it's a really, you've brought up so many good points today, Jenna, but on, <laughs> on, on that point, um, I see a lot of people kind of, they have one reason not to take a supplement, eat the food or whatever it may be. And we yeah. sort of forget the 10 reasons why we should be. It's almost like the, the removing of the yeah. food is more important than the addition of the food yes. uh, and I did a I did a, um, a webinar recently on histamine intolerance and just as an example on that idea you know there was a, a paper discussing um, all sorts of different foods and the role that they can play in stabilizing mast cells or basically being of benefit in histamine um, modulation for one of a better term and actually constituents in green tea and cinnamon at least in kind of preclinical studies have been shown to be favorable in sort of managing our histamine loads even yeah. though on most food lists they will be spoken about as kind of histamine liberators or being foods to avoid and again it's like well don't avoid it just because it's on a list how do you respond to it because actually it might be that the favorable element in cinnamon outweighs the the negative so to speak yeah, there's there's often very few black and whites. It's, it's often lots of shades of grey, mm. and yeah, people get quite defensive with the the histamine food list. I've found when <laughs> whenever you try and sort of suggest that they add in the food that's on one of these like blacklisted uh, histamine food lists, and it's you know there's so many of these foods have so many beneficial of these sort of bioactive compounds that might on balance be actually providing you with what your body's craving and needing to support you through whatever issues you're having rather than just 
blanket removing them because you end up removing so much and yeah it's just then impossible to yeah it's a lot of trying to I don't know educate around this in a real gentle way I think yeah definitely I think um it's a strange one I mean I, I've had histamine issues on and off for, for years and years and years so I can completely relate yeah um, and I think I've tried an actual low histamine diet once, but it was just like, this is just not worth it. <laughs> I prefer to have some symptoms and actually deal with, you know, what else I'm, what's that, what else is going on in life that might be driving some of this, yeah. Um, yeah. rather than having to be on a restrictive diet and avoiding certain foods that I just absolutely love. Like, I love hummus. Yeah, I'm not going to stop eating hummus. <laughs> it is, it's, I think, knowledge to some degree is power within the health space, but it's knowledge, understanding that, as you say, there's just so much grey here. Yeah. Uh, we need to find ways of being more comfortable sitting in that grey as we as we go through our kind of health journey, ultimately. And yeah. that's, that's hard, admittedly, for all sorts of different reasons, and probably even more so over the last year and a half. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the more we can educate and, and provide that context, the more hopefully the chains come off and we start to feel a bit more liberated again. Yeah, exactly. It is really hard when you can eat anything at any point, at any time, like never before. Like, I think that is a bit of a, a challenge when you don't have the option. Mm. Just, you know, maybe life was a lot simpler. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, the, I'm sure you probably have found this, Jenna. One of the most common statements I hear is, you know, one day I can eat this food and be fine. And on a different day, I, I react to it and I'm bloated or something happens. And I always go great okay so we know it's not the food <laughs> so you know we can we want to obviously try and limit the amount of symptoms someone's experiencing especially if they're quite debilitating but it is a great point that okay this isn't a food problem per se and um, the fact that you can be asymptomatic and have it on Sunday shows us that uh, yeah. and it's quite a, a nice way to kind of shift that yeah no, I agree. but I'm mindful of your time Jenna we could uh, probably talk all day um, is there anything that you just want to conclude with or sort of re-emphasize from today's conversation? Um, I mean, I guess we didn't, we didn't talk much about sort of stress and trauma. Um, so maybe that's a good thing to sort of finish on. Mm. Um, I think it's becoming more and more talked about how important stress is in, in sort of eroding our health and something that we might not necessarily be aware of or we're not able to change the things that are causing us stress so that we can sort of transform it I always kind of think of it as you know we all have a different size of stress bucket so I think I've got quite a small stress bucket whereas my husband I think he's got quite a large stress bucket so mine will fill up really quickly and I get I'm quite a stress head it can get stressed out by a lot of little things very easily so I need to be emptying my bucket a lot more often than say he does so I need that again consistency in the little activities that I do through my week to manage stress and it, it's tricky because there's so many different resources online for stress and not every, everyone will take to them all so for some people meditation might be quite stressful and also if you're really stressed because you've just had a situation arise that's triggered that in you you're probably not just going to sit there and meditate on it because you might be in the supermarket or you might be in your office environment at work or you know um so I think I'm often really reluctant to give people a list of like stress busting things they can do but what I I think of it as you know we can do sort of future proofing against stress so think about your stress bucket how how quickly does it get full um, is it a small bucket that overflows very easily? So you need to be future proofing against potential big stressors that come up because um, you might feel them a lot more strongly than someone someone else does. And what can you do that can future proof that? And that will be different for everyone. So meditation and mindfulness, obviously sort of science backed ways to approach that. And it, I see them as not things that you do when you are stressed, but things that you do every day or frequently to protect you from the stresses when they arise exercise um or any kind of moving of your body uh but then you need the real time stress busters for when that stressful situation does arise and you feel like you're just about to crumble because 
it's all so overwhelming physically and mentally and for me doing a lot of research on this area as a person who gets easily stressed I, I feel like we have to take agency over the things we have conscious control over so that's like uh, our breath which is a big one we can sort of automatically breathe without even realizing it or we can consciously breathe and so much of the nervous system um is there connected to the diaphragm it's giving a feedback to our brain um, and our breathing will change when we're stressed but if we can consciously override that and take like some deep inhales and extended exhales or do some kind of physiological sigh which is like a double inhale exhale it can really send that feedback to our brain that we are okay we are you know there's nothing to panic about um also the, the other thing that i find quite fascinating is the eyes so the, the panoramic vision so this idea that when you're stressed you will narrow your vision and the muscles around the eyes will like because it's it's like a laser focus to you know get you out of danger that kind of um, evolutionary uh, idea of, of stress as a, a way to motivate us to safety and so we can you know get up from our desk look out the window look broadly open up the the vision so it's not like really focused but more panoramic going for a walk is probably even better getting into nature which we know has lots of um things that can really um uh, tame down that stress response um these are things we can just do when we are really stressed or depending on what situation you're in um and then there's the kind of like hormetic stressors where you you physically put yourself in a stressful situation. And this is again, to kind of uh, make yourself more robust to that stress when it comes. So where I live in Brighton, everyone jumps in the sea in the winter and that's, it's quite stressful because it's a real <laughs> shock to the system. Um, but that's kind of deliberately saying, I'm going to go out and get stressed and do something it could be really extreme exercise or something that really gets, gets you stressed in a controlled way that you're comfortable with that means you're much better at buffering stresses or when they come and I think it's it's really tricky to talk about I speak to so many people who are stressed but often people feel like oh, I can't change that I can't change so many things and it's true we can only change what we can change and some things we can't change a family situation a work situation but we can sort of try to consistently implement these sort of future proofing strategies to, to buffer the stress when it comes to keep that stress bucket from from overflowing so continually emptying it so we're not already at the top and something tips us over the edge and then you know using things like breath work um, and there's lots of information online about you know different ways that we can do this mm -hmm. and saying this is my kind of a uh, real-time tool that I'm going to employ in that moment when uh, something hits you. And I think I love the idea of rituals. So um, there's this sense of we can have this Pavlovian conditioning of the immune system. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Some experiments that were done a really long time ago. So Pavlov's dogs salivate when they saw food because they learned that they were about to get fed. So this idea that Pavlovian conditioning works because we have this the power of association. So we associate an unconditioned stimulus to bring about a particular response to a new stimulus. Um, so they, they've done lots of studies in animals and the immune system with this. So, you know, inducing inflammation in an animal, but at the same time, they're doing something else to the animal, like giving it a, a smell or um, giving it a, a particular type of food. And then they find that when they take away, so if you're injecting the animal with something that causes inflammation and at the same time delivering a smell or another stimulus, when you take away the injection and just give the smell, you get you can see the ch same changes in inflammatory markers in the blood or um changes in lymphocyte numbers in the blood um i think there was one study where they looked in mice and they gave um poly ic which is a toll like receptor ligand which will lead to um um stimulation of immune cells and you can measure the inflammation in the blood um but they also gave the odor of camphor so it's quite a pungent strong smell um and so 
eventually they took away the poly IC and when they just gave the mouse camphor to smell, they got the same reaction in the blood and they could measure. So it's just, it's like the placebo effect possibly. Um, I think no one's really sure how it's working. It's like the nervous system is getting sing signals from the immune system and also from whatever else is going on. So from whatever the stimulus is, as well as the, um, the sensory stimulus and integrating that so that when you take away one stimulus and you just have the sensory stimulus, it's um, it's still giving the same response to the immune system. So it's this kind of crosstalk between the brain and the immune system that we're still kind of understanding, I think. But, you know, we could build our own rituals. So I like to think of it if I want to be relaxed um, and I'm doing things that make me feel relaxed, but I'm also using different smells at home or music, a piece of music that I love, that then when I'm stressed, I can put on that same music and to help myself sort of tune into how I feel, you know, when I was listening to that music and I was relaxing at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's kind of something to consider and it, you know maybe to end on that I think that you know the whole concept of wellness is really about your state of mind you know I can be emptying the dishwasher in the morning but I have a sense of wellness because of how I what context I give to that that I'm like I'm with my family I'm you know building this home I'm, or I can just be like oh you know waking up in the morning emptying the dishwasher like it's a proper chore and you know I think we can build these rituals into our day really small and and make it about our state of mind rather than you know the narrative that we keep telling ourselves yeah I guess kind of bringing more awareness to our day as you're saying I um, mean you know, being mindful of okay what is the story I'm telling myself right now yeah. And on that note, I guess, you know, the idea of creating health, you know, even in the, the complementary, whatever you want to call it, health space, there's still a lot of managing dis-ease rather than creating health. Um, and again, I've been guilty of doing this both for myself, but sometimes with clients where we get a bit bogged down in the, the, the problem, ultimately, yeah. rather than saying, OK, well, I'll, what are we doing that's cultivating happiness, gratitude, yeah. etc.? cetera? Um, so, yeah, this idea of mindset is just is huge. So I think a, yeah. a very good point to, to conclude on today. <laughs> Jenna, thank you so much. I could honestly listen to you all day. It's been a, it's been brilliant to chat. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been lovely. It's been lovely to catch up. Absolutely. Thank you.